Look, in the few minutes we got left, uh, I just want to continue <coughs> to talk a little bit. Uh, we've been talking about contentment. Uh, um, for those of you that were here last week, uh, if you weren't here last week, then you can, you can go online and find that. But we're just going to spend a few weeks talking about contentment because we live in a world that is very much geared towards discontentment, isn't it? it it's pushing us, it, it's telling us every day we actually don't have everything we need. We actually do need another pair of sneakers. We actually do need another handbag. And all the ladies said... Amen. We do need uh, a, a, a faster car. We do need a bigger house. We do need this and we do need that. And until we get those things, we will be just like that old prophet Michael Jagger who said, I can't get no satisfaction. Okay? We will be just like that. And, and, and of course, if you know the song and you see the lyrics, it might, Michael, Mick Jagger's talking not about contentment, he's talking about satisfaction. And there is a difference between the two. Satisfaction is a temporary thing where momentarily a need has been met. But if you are only looking for satisfaction in life, what satisfies you one moment eventually no longer satisfies you anymore. Is that right? You get something and you think, okay, that's the last time uh, I'm ever, and the Lucas are possibly watching this. Uh, ben Luca, seriously, Ben, maybe you'll see it online. If I get another one wheel, just the one wheel that's just those couple of revs faster, uh, a, a little bit longer, the wheel's a little wider, then I'll stop there. But then after a while, you go, hang on, there's another one a little bit longer with a little bit wider wheel, and it goes a little bit faster. So until I get that, I buy it, then I'm satisfied. Then before long, what satisfied me no longer satisfies me any more. We're not trying to live a life of satisfaction where we're constantly chasing. Contentment is more long-term. Contentment is a state that doesn't come and go because contentment doesn't have anything really to do with what's happening outside of me. Contentment has more to do with what's going on on the inside of me. And so we're talking about contentment. Now, We've got another couple of weeks on this, but I just want to uh, uh, leave you with a thought today. And I want to start in Romans 8.37, and you're probably going to read this and go, what has that got to do with contentment? Please don't clock off. Stay with me. We're going somewhere. Romans 8 and verse 37, Paul the Apostle writes these words. He says, in all these things, everyone say all these things. All these things. Not in some of them. He says, in all these things, we are what? We are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. Don't stop there. We're more than conquerors. Let me tell you something. If you get rid of the through him who loved us, you take Jesus out of my life, I don't have enough strength to conquer. Okay? I'm not more than a conqueror. Without Christ, I wasn't even a conqueror. I wasn't even good enough to conquer. Okay? I was just a conk. Right? But, 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 but with Jesus, it says that through him and the strength he gives me and my knowledge of him and my awareness that he is for me and not against me and with me, through that, I can actually live life like more than a conqueror. Now, now the context Paul's talking about this, and I'm very big on context. When we take a verse out of the Bible, it's really good to have a look at context because we get ourselves in all kinds of weird and wonderful places and troubles by plucking out our faith. We cherry pick our favorite things and come up with theologies that actually don't work, but then we dig our heels in and we defend the theology that doesn't work instead of going, hang on, maybe that's not exactly what that means. It's like the Billings method of contraception years ago when we were in YWAM. Anyone ever heard of the Billings method? Yep, and it goes on body temperature and ovulations and when you should and shouldn't come together as man and wife and so on. And so we, there was this, this period in Youth with the Mission when we were there where every woman was on the Billings Method. When I say woman, married women. Every married woman was on the Billings Method, right? And what happened to, I think, every single one of them on the Billings Method, you know what happened? They fell pregnant. But you know what they did? Instead of sitting back and going, okay, let's have a look at this, maybe the Billings Method doesn't actually work as perfectly as what we thought it did because they weren't trying to get pregnant. They were trying to come together and not get pregnant at that time when the ovulation cycle, and, but they got pregnant. But instead of being humbly going, maybe that doesn't work the way we think it does, they defended the method and made themselves sound like we must have made a mistake. And how many Christians do that? We, 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 we have this theology of everything should work like this and when it doesn't, we look for reasons to blame ourselves or blame others. You don't have enough faith. 
You, do, you didn't this. I remember being at a, a, a mate's place years ago, you, 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 a long time ago, and I hope he's not watching, he's a good man, but he's probably not watching actually. But we went around to their house one time and we were talking about this uh, guy we knew that was praying for somebody. I don't remember the whole story, but um, when I lived in Brisbane, I used to get random phone calls from people. My son, uh, and if you're not a believer, you may not sort of understand this context, but we, we, as believers, we believe in this natural world we live in, but there's another dimension. There's a spiritual world. And we believe in angels, and angels are uh, ministering to God's people, and they're all around us in this room right now, uh, and, and, and there are also demons. We believe in that. And, and I used to get these calls from people, and I don't know where they got my number from, but people would say, call this guy. And they would say, I've got a, a son or a daughter, and they've got this demon at home and they're frothing on the couch and would you come and pray for them and things like that so I would go and pray for these people you know and 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 I realized that there's no formula involved in what you say it's just the power and the authority of Jesus and walking in that and understanding that you know this thing's got to go not because I'm great I'm nothing uh, but you know it's like a policeman uh, standing in the middle of the street doing that it's not the policeman himself he's just flesh and blood but when he's got that badge on it represents authority and, and you stop your car even if you're built like a big brick toilet and he's like a stick, you still listen to the guy, even though you know because it's not him, it's the badge that he's got and you, you have to honour that, that badge. And so I remember we were chatting with this family and the guy said to me, it was weird, we'd, we'd pray, we're talking about a guy that prayed for someone and they didn't get set free. And, and I, I said, yeah, they, 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 they prayed and they come up and they said, in the name of Jesus, you know, uh, come out. And, and it didn't happen. And this guy says to me, oh, I know why it didn't happen. I said, well, why? He said, because you didn't say, of Nazareth. <laughs> I said, what? Because I thought he's joking. He's serious. He goes, no, no. You've got to say, in the name of Jesus, of Nazareth. And if he had said, of Nazareth, this demon would have left, and you'd be fine. And I'm looking at him thinking, you have to be joking. You're too intelligent to not be joking. But he wasn't joking. So I'm only left with the other alternative. Maybe he wasn't as intelligent as I thought. Jesus of Nazareth, because, and, and so we defend these things, right? That way we defend these things instead of realising that sometimes, Terry picking our favourite verses and coming up with theologies, sometimes our theology, the place we land theology is sometimes not right. Okay? So I'm saying all that to say, in all these things we're more than conquerors, it says through, through Christ. So if I take Christ out, uh, no, it, it's, it's through him, it's not, not me. But the context Paul's talking about here, if you go back through the passage, here's what Paul says. He says he's talking about our present sufferings. He says our present sufferings. So he's talking to going, acknowledging right now we've got suffering going on around us, right? But he still lands that we're more than conquerors. But he says we've got these present sufferings. He talks about the creation around us is groaning. It's, it's, it's ready for the return of Christ. He says the Spirit helps us in our weakness. In other words, you've got weaknesses, and it's the Holy Spirit that's helping you in those weaknesses. So he's talking about sufferings, groanings, weaknesses. He talks about who can separate us from the love of Christ. Shall trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. He's talking about all these things that we would say, a, 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 you know, Debbie Downers, they're not the kind of things we want in life. And if you do want hardship and persecution, famine, nakedness, danger and sword, we will pray for you because that's not normal. Nobody wants that stuff. But this is the context he's talking about. These are all the things that are going on. But in the end, he says, but you know, even though all that's happening, we're still more than conquerors through that. Still more than conquerors through that. And anyone ever won a race? You ever run a race and won? I know Ben has. Um, um, Nick Watson's not here today. Uh, he didn't win his last race because Ben beat him. Um, but uh, you, you know that feeling you get of elation when you win a race? Anyone ever won a race or something? Or, or have you ever had a family tipping comp and you won it? And you just, you just know I'm better than the rest of you. Yeah. And there's that feeling of I'm better. I won. I'm great. Look how awesome I am. Or you aced a test at school and you topped the marks at school or something like that. Or you went for that interview and there were 20,000 people going for the job and you got the job. And there's that feeling, that incredible wave of, of satisfaction and, and contentment that comes over us. Wow, all that hard work I put in or whatever, I, I, I've achieved, I've got something. And there's this great sense of contentment just by winning the race or just by acing the test. But Paul goes a step further and goes, look, I'm not saying you're just a conqueror. Imagine the contentment you get when you conquer something. Paul says you are more than a conqueror. You are more than just a conqueror. So conquerors can find contentment in their conquering. 
But Paul says you're beyond just being a conqueror. So if a conqueror finds contentment in conquering, how much more is it possible for us to find contentment in our life if, according to Paul, even with all this other stuff going on, we can land in a place where we are more than conquerors. More than conquerors, he says. You know, I was on a plane once to New Zealand, and uh, on this plane was, um, you know, the stewards and the, the, the people that do the thing. And, and this, this guy was really, really funny, actually. And uh, he made this statement, and I, I thought it was classic. You know when you land the plane and everybody gets up before the unbuckle seatbelt signs? Anyone here do that? As soon as it's on the ground and rolling, you just can't wait to get off. So you stand up and unbuckle, and they're all trying to say, put your seatbelts back, and everybody's up walking around. He got up and he said this. He said, look, please remain seated and buckled until the uh, fastened seatbelt signs are released. And then he said this. He said, in the history of aviation, it's a known fact that no passenger has ever reached the terminal before the plane. (laughs) So just sit down, just relax, just stay seated, because you're going to get there in the end, you know, you're going to get there in the end. Philippians chapter 4, we were talking about this last week, Philippians 4, 11 to 13, this is Paul, and he says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, he's, he's thanking them for an offering, a financial offering that came to them in a difficult season of his life. He says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, I've learnt to be content whatever the circumstances. A little bit like Paul was saying. Paul says, I'm more than a conqueror in spite of the circumstances. It's not circumstantial as to whether I conquer. It's not circumstantial as to whether I can have contentment. Those things are available. They're realities. I've just got to find them. I've just got to find them. He says, I've learnt the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, living in plenty or in want. And the secret is this. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Again, it's a little bit like I'm a conqueror, uh, more than a conqueror through him who loves it. It's funny how, how when they talk about victory, success, making it, surviving, all this stuff, they always link that state of being to your relationship with God, don't they? They always link it to your knowledge of God. Never link it to you. It's not about your brilliant intellect or your great capacity. Uh, it, it, they always link it to your capacity to be connected to and to know God, to know Jesus through him. We can do these things through him. We can be more than conquerors. And through him and the, and the knowledge of his presence with me, I can find contentment no matter where I am. The contentment's not about where I am. It's about who's there with me. It's God that's with me in each and every one of those situations. So last week we started looking at contentment, um, and, and we want to continue to talk about that. Now, now, Paul's speaking here of any area of discontent, that fits into the category of any and every. Paul said, I found the secret to contentment, he said, in any and every situation. So I want you to think about areas of discontent in your life right now, and I want to ask you a simple question. Does that area fit into the categories of any and every? And if it fits into the category of any and every, then Paul is saying it is possible for you to find a place of contentment in that. Think about that for a second. How do you find contentment when your boat is sinking and you've fr- jumped overboard in the water and you're floating around in a raging sea? How do you remain contented and find contentment when you're on to your 35th lash? Paul talks about in Corinthians, oh, I've been lashed, I've been this, I've been that. All this. How, do you, how do you honestly say that even in all those moments? By the way, he never said I enjoyed them. He never said I enjoyed them. He never said they were fun. But he said, I found content. I was contented in knowing that everything that was going on around me, Christ was with me. Christ was with me. And because I'm walking with Jesus, I'm very contented to the fact also that because my life is in alignment with him, whatever's happening, he's aware of. He's aware of it in the moment. How do you find that place? See, Paul speaks of any area of contentment, any and every situation. But he doesn't say that the secret to all of that is coming through. Notice, notice Paul's wording. He says, I've learned how to find contentment in these situations, N- not on the other side of the situation. How, how, many, how many of us live our life like this? When I get that pay rise. When the kids grow up, then. When that car is finally paid off, then. When, when, when the, the, the surgery's over, then. When I find Mr. or Mrs. Wright, then. On the other side of this, then. That's not what Paul's talking about. Paul's saying you can find contentment in any and every circumstance. Contentment can be found in any and every situation. In other words, here's the thing. You can be hungry 
but not hangry. Think about that. You can be hungry, but you don't have to be hangry. You can have no food in your belly, but somehow in the midst of that, find a place of contentment, even in the midst of the hardest struggle, because I know my Saviour and I know he's with me and he's for me and he's not against me. Now, here's the thing I want to ask you. Do you actually believe that, though? Do we actually believe that? Because here's what I know. And there's a whole industry that backs me up on this. It's called Hollywood. Anyone ever seen those movies where there's a treasure map, right? And it's just this weird... We watched a movie last night, actually, um, called The Lost City, I think it was. And, and um, it's this, this, this woman writes a book, Sandra Bullock. She writes this book with her husband, who's an archaeologist. And, and so she's writing in this book some stuff that he's discovered in archaeology. Long story short, she doesn't realise that what she's writing is actually part of a treasure map. Another guy realises it is, kidnaps her and says, you've got to interpret this for me now and let's find this treasure. She doesn't believe in the treasure. She just thinks she's writing a book. So because she doesn't believe there's a treasure there, guess what? You don't go looking for it. Because if you don't think something's out there, you don't go looking for it, do you? You don't search after something you don't think exists. Okay? You don't go looking for it. So what happens is that in that particular situation, there's a moment where the penny drops for her and she goes, you know what? I actually believe that there is a treasure there. And at that point, she changes her life and she gets up and she begins to look for that treasure. And it's a little bit like that with God. If you don't actually think you can find contentment in the midst of whatever you're going through in life, here's my guarantee to you. If you don't think you can find it, you won't look for it. And you'll forever be discontented until I get through until that changes, until I have more, until I have less. You'll never actually look for contentment, and that doesn't mean it's not there. It just means you're not looking for it because you don't believe it exists. So it's so important that we actually look at what Paul had to say. It's so important that we get into the Word of God and we be convinced by the Word of God that, yes, you can actually find a place of contentment in this life. Paul says contentment is not something to be experienced then, He says contentment is something you can experience in life right now. Who believes that? Who believes they can experience contentment right now? Think about that area of your world where you're struggling to find contentment. Now, in the middle of that, do you actually believe that with Christ you can find a place of contentment in the midst of that? See, I believe that you can. And and we're running out of time, so I just want to give you one thing to think about, though, with contentment. As I said, we're going to continue this on. And here's what I want you to understand. The good news, or for some people you might think this is the bad news about contentment. I think it's good news. The good news about contentment is this. Contentment is not resignation. Being contented doesn't mean that you are resigning yourself to what is right now. Being content with your marriage doesn't mean that your marriage can't get better and that you might not want to invest into that and make it better. Being content with your financial state doesn't mean that you stay where you are and that you don't look for opportunities to earn more money or to get a promotion or whatever. Being content isn't a state of resignation. It's not about accepting that who I am today is who I will always be. It's not about accepting that what I have today is all I'm ever going to have. And it's not about accepting that where I am today in life is where I will always stay. Contentment is not resignation. In in, in 1 Corinthians 7.21, I think this is a good example, Paul uh, writes this to the Corinthian church. Now, there were a lot of slaves that came to faith in the early days of Christianity. A lot of slaves, a lot of uh, uh, women, a lot of people in society and community in general that were not given status or recognition, didn't have a lot of opportunity. It's amazing how the acceptance, the love, the grace of Christ really appealed to them. Uh, it gave them significance. They realized they had significance in God, value in God. There's neither Jew, nor Greek, slave, nor free, all this stuff. We are equal in the eyes of God, no matter what color background, whatever, he loves us all the same. And so Paul writes this to some people in the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 7, 21. Were you a slave when you were called? In other words, when you became a Christian, were you a slave? He says, don't let it trouble you. In other words, it's okay. You came to faith as a slave. Don't be troubled by that. You can be content as a slave and being a Christian and working for your master. Be the best slave that any slave master has in the whole community. Be the poster boy for slavery. Be the best. If you're going to be, be the best. This is what he's saying. Don't let it trouble you. However, if you can gain your freedom, do it. In other words, be content. You're a slave right now. Be content with that. But if you can better yourself, you should do it. 
If you can get ahead, have a crack at it. If you can get more, don't be afraid to reach for it. Don't be afraid to go after it. It's okay. Contentment doesn't mean that you're going to decide, I'm content with this situation, so it's going to stay that way for the rest of my life. That is not what contentment means. That is not what contentment is. Contentment is about finding a place of rest and peace in the midst of what you're going through now, but it's not about saying, I'm going to stay there. In fact, I don't believe that God wants any of us to stay there. See, here's the truth. God has not invested his word, uh, his spirit, his authority, his power, his provision, his wisdom, his creativity, his capacity to generate wealth, his capacity for you to love, his capacity for you to care. God has not invested that capacity in you for you to live a stagnant life and stay where you are. God wants us to grow. He wants us to walk forward. He wants us to rise, to stand up, and to keep going. He wants us to take ground. He wants us to keep moving. Go back to the Garden of Eden, a perfect world without sin before Adam and Eve even sinned. And what does God say to them? He says, here's the world. He says, fill the earth, subdue, multiply, have dominion. He doesn't say, here's how it is, in case there are, there are, there are, whatever will be, will be. Just make sure it stays exactly the same as it was, and I'll be happy. He says, I don't want it to stay the same way it was. I want you to take it forward. I want you to tend these gardens. I want you to trim these trees. I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply. I want to see this thing that you're starting with get bigger and better and better and better. That's what I want you to do. I want you to manage it in such a way that it continues to get better. And that's our life. In Matthew 25, we've got the parable of the talents. And and without going uh, through the whole parable, we all know there's a guy that gets 10, a guy gets five and three and one, whatever it is. And in the end, the guy that gets the five puts it to work, comes back, the master goes, what do you got? And he says, I had five, another five. And the master goes, that is awesome, well done. Guy has three. The master comes and says, what did you do with the three? He says, I doubled it. Yeah, gave me three. Here's six back. He goes, awesome, well done. Then the guy that got the one, buries it in the ground and the master comes back and he says you're a hard man Uh, now I think that's hard to believe he was a hard man because going back to the beginning of the parable it says that he gave one five or one ten one three one whatever but he says each according to their ability so he gave each one of them what they could handle it doesn't sound like a harsh man to me a harsh man had been giving you a job you couldn't complete and then getting mad at you for not doing it. But he wasn't harsh. He gave to each according to what they could do, according to their ability. Sounds like a pretty fair man to me. And the guy that has the one buries it. And when the master comes back, here's what the master says in verse 26 and 27. The master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. You knew that I harvest where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. In other words, what I give you, I I want something back from it. Even if it was just a bit of interest. Because what I gave you, I want you to do it better. I want you to make something of what I've given you. Okay? So, So... Living a contented life is not about resigning yourself to where you are, who you are, and what you have. There's nothing wrong with changing as a person. In fact, I think God wants us to, when I read that, God wants us to transform and become in the image of Jesus. That's change and transformation, right? I think God wants us to be the best in our field and the best at what we do. I don't think there's a problem with us having a dream for a bigger house or car, whatever. Nothing wrong with any of those things. Uh, However, so long as we don't think that when we get there, we'll find contentment in that, you'll never find something over there that you can't have here. And that's the problem with with the self-motivation and help these days. Reach for this, go for that, or more for it. But if you think that that's going to give you something, a type of contentment you can't have here, then you shouldn't run after it. Find contentment here first. Because you're only going to be the same discontented person, but you're going to have that. Because you'll take you into that. And that's what Paul's getting at. Contentment is not about resignation. As a matter of fact, at the end of, of, of that verse in Philippians, if you go to the very next verse, uh, verse 14, after saying, I've learnt the secret of contentment, I can have a lot and have a little and so on, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Then he says this, even though I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, it was still good of you to share in my troubles. In other words, you know what? Yeah, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but helping me get out of that is also good too. Because being contented doesn't mean I'm resigned to the fact, no, 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 take your money back. I don't want to eat. I don't want to eat. I don't want to get out of prison. You take it back. Give it back to... No, no, no. 
He says, it's actually good that you did that because it helps me get a little bit of my needs met. It helps me move a little forward from the station or place where I am right now. So contentment is not about resigning yourself to what you have, who you are, and where you are in life at the moment. But here's the thing, again, if you don't believe you can find contentment, you're just not going to go looking for it at all. I'll give you this definition of contentment. So contentment is not resignation, then what is contentment? Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30. There's an American author by the name of Gary Thomas, and he wrote a book called Authentic Faith. And in that book, he defines contentment as this. He says it's soul rest. He says contentment is soul rest. In Matthew 28, Jesus says this, Matthew 11, sorry, verse 28 to 30, he says, come to me. It's amazing how all these things that, that God gives us, all of them, uh, they all wrap around one thing and they all have a condition to them. Hey, come to me. Stay in a relationship with me. Get to know me. It all comes back to Jesus. That's amazing. We try to isolate these things and turn them into self-help things. No, 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 take Jesus out of it. You're still going to struggle. Stay connected to Jesus. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. There's a message in that. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You'll find rest for your souls. And I think that is a great definition of contentment. When you're weary and you're burdened and you're struggling and you're discontented, if you come to him and refocus and get a, a fresh picture of what's going on. And realise that I don't care if the circumstance doesn't change. Jesus is right here with me in the midst of this thing. Wow. That, that is way more important to me than whether I get through this thing. I want to get through this thing. And I, but you know, the fact that Jesus is in the boat with me is way more important. and It's way more significant that Jesus be in the boat with me than he calm a storm. Calming a storm is not a miracle, really. If you created the world by saying, let there be, is that really a big deal? The greater miracle was that while they're panicking and freaking out in the boat, Jesus is asleep on a pillow. He's in the same storm, in the same boat with them. He's resting his soul. They're panicking because they're focused on that instead of looking at him and going, that's how you handle it. Okay, I get it. There's the miracle. The greater miracle is that we can make it through the storms. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. The shadow of death is there, but I'm going through it with Jesus. I'm going through it with him. And why am I so convinced that anyone can find contentment? Well, because of that most out-of-context verse that there probably is in the New Testament. Thank you for the picture of the T-shirt. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Paul said, I can do everything and anything through Christ who strengthens me. Now, why am I convinced that you can have contentment no matter what you're going through in your life? Very simply, because when Paul said, I can do all things, what was he talking about? He was talking specifically about having lack or having lots. He wasn't talking about, I can jump off the roof of this building and not make a splat noise through Christ who strengthens me. It's not what he's saying. He wasn't saying that I could pick up a guitar and play it like Tommy Emmanuel in five minutes through Christ who gives me strength. He wasn't saying that I could walk out this room and create a billion dollar business in three days just because I love Jesus and I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. He didn't say that. What he's talking about specifically and in context, the all things are this. I can handle any and every situation and circumstance of life. That's the all things. No matter what I'm going through, no matter what you're going through, Paul gives you an ironclad guarantee. Here's the thing. A lot of people want to grab that verse and use it for other things that it doesn't mean. Go hard and maybe it'll work out for you. That's fine. But I'm telling you now, the thing that it does mean 100% is this. No matter what you're going through in life right now, you can find contentment in that place in who you are, in what you have, in where you are. You can find contentment. Paul was so convinced that he said, I can do it all, any circumstance, through Christ who strengthens me. And, and that's good news for you today. But the question is, do you believe it? Next couple of weeks or next week, we're going to talk a bit more practical about a few areas. But if you don't believe you can find contentment, next week will fall on deaf ears and you won't, feel any, you won't get anything out of it. So I want to encourage you today, go back, have a look at that verse, read it and sit there and think about your area of your world where you're struggling, finding hard to get contentment. Ask yourself the question, do I really believe that I can find contentment? And if you can, 
then we can go on a bit of a journey and I believe that God can bring you to a place of contentment in your life. Amen? If you don't, well, you'll get what you believe there too. Amen? Father, thank you for this morning. Lord, thank you for, again, the opportunity to be here together. We, uh, uh, Lord, we are, are so grateful again we can do this. Lord, we can gather, we can meet. So many of our brothers and sisters can't do it. We can. Once again, thank you for the freedom and liberty we have. And Father, I pray for each person in this room. Holy Spirit, when we get up and leave, don't let us just move on to the next thing. Whatever seed you've planted, what you've spoken to us in our hearts, germinate that seed, water that seed, cause us to talk about that seed with other people. Ask people to pray for us, to just uh, put some fertilizer on that seed. Lord, don't let us just get up, walk away and go, we've done church, Sunday's over, let's get on with the week. We want to grow and be conformed into the image of Jesus. And Lord, also, as we go about this place the next seven days, there are people out there that don't know you. Lord, would you give each of us in this room that know you, give us a chance to tell somebody about the goodness of God, somebody that up to now has no idea that there's a saviour that died for them, that loves them, and that has arms wide open for them. Let us tell them about that in the next seven days. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Awesome. Awesome. Bless you guys.